Take off 27 right, 240, 20 knots. Take off 27 right, give it one. Every morning, British Airways flight BA-1 leaves Heathrow for New York. Concord 1, ML 41123, decimal 9 ML. 1239, the Concord 1. Yes, please, goodbye. Good night. On Thursday, the 23rd of April, 1987, flight BA-1 was nearly in collision with a small aircraft in the sky over Reading. In a dimly lit room in West London, an air traffic controller sitting at this desk had spoken to Concorde only seconds before. He could do nothing to prevent the incident. In Britain, we have never had a mid-air collision involving a civil airliner. But today, as never before, Britain's skies are saturated. Are we asking too much of our air traffic controllers? The Concorde air miss only became public because of leaks to the press. It's been a year of crisis headlines, many inspired by air traffic controllers, worried about their responsibilities. What is the truth behind these headlines? Last April, this document was leaked. It contained an angry report from an anonymous controller. He complained that morale was low and that equipment, especially the main IBM computer, was unreliable. He concluded, I just hope the air misses that happen, including the ones which go unreported, do not turn into something more drastic. Then an ex-controller spoke out on television. The only other uh, IBM 9020 I know of in this country is in the Kensington South Science Museum, and that's where ours should be. Mike Thompson had just retired as a senior controller. If the air traffic controllers could speak out without fear of their, control their careers being jeopardised, they would agree. But naturally enough, you, and you can understand this, a working controller who stands up and says this sort of thing is not going to be very popular in certain quarters. And Horizon found that few working controllers felt able to speak openly about the pressures upon them. One who did is Dave Vaughan, a senior controller with nearly 20 years experience. He's also a union representative. He sums up controllers' anxieties. The controllers are very professional sort of people. They are concerned that the system that they are operating is not as efficient as it should be, and they want to see changes. They have tried internally. We've held meetings, we've explained our grievances directly, and the controllers feel that nothing is being done, or at least it isn't being done quickly enough. Controllers' worries stem directly from a massive increase in air traffic over Britain. Last year was an all-time record. British controllers handled over 3 million aircraft. That's over 8,000 every day. Heathrow is already the busiest international airport in the world. And here, traffic is increasing by 5% every year. Obviously, there is a finite capacity at Heathrow. We're getting fairly close to it and uh, I don't envisage that we can go on with another 5% per annum for more than two or three more years. I think at that stage, unless something unusual uh, occurs, we're going to be in the house full situation. Air traffic control in Britain is run by the Civil Aviation Authority. They agree traffic is reaching capacity, not just at Heathrow, but over much of Britain. There is a limit to the number of, of planes that can be in the airspace at any one time. It's a little like a motorway in that sense. Uh, you can pile more and more cars onto a motorway, but the more you pile on, the slower they'll go, and ultimately you'll have traffic jams. And 
in the air, you have to try to avoid that sort of situation. And there are signs that we're approaching the limit, not just for runways, but for men as well. A young controller arrives at Heathrow for the afternoon shift. This is the air traffic control familiar to the public. The visual control tower at Heathrow. It's known as the goldfish bowl. Here, controllers spend their seven-hour shift watching out for aircraft. It's a matter, they say, of using the Mark I eyeball. Lots of 282, you're clear for takeoff. The service wind 320 is five knots. Terminal 157, you're clear to take off. Left turn out to be 250, initially, please. Service wind 330 at 5 knots. 157, clear to take off. Left turn out 250 degrees. Concord Alpha Charlie, clear to take off. Wind 330 8 knots. Concord Alpha Charlie, clear to take off. A controller can keep this up for two hours. After that, his concentration will weaken and he must have a fatigue break. Concord Alpha Charlie, depart at 03, contact London Control 128 decimal 9 today. 1289, bye bye. This place is as unfamiliar to the public as the airport control tower is familiar. The London Air Traffic Control Centre at RAF West Drayton likes anonymity. Recently, it has failed to get it. The morning shift arrives for work. It's just before 7.30. Ahead of them lie seven hours of intense concentration. But these controllers never see an actual aircraft. In the low light of West Drayton's operations room, they spend their shift looking at radar screens. Despite its name, the London Air Traffic Control Centre covers not just London, but most of Britain. It's here that controllers are under greatest pressure. Three five six. Yeah, okay. You've seen him gone. John, it's a very peculiar split. Yeah. He's getting all the pavilions for Heathrow, all the options going to him. There's no other way. Right. He's got that one. You've got him heading 160 clear down to 13. The Iran just cleared up to 47. Ryan 204 Quebec, uh, due to inspection on the next sector. Could you stop the climb flat at the 37? Right, can you stop that for return at 044 off 27, John? Yeah, okay, we'll be one zero. Man 8 west of Bobbington at the moment is Ryan 310 in here. Here, controllers instruct all aircraft taking off or landing, as well as everything that flies over England and Wales. 77328. Fine Air 310, descend to 6,000 feet. Brookman's Park, Caledonian 905, Gatwick North, I get 240 from Platinum. West Drayton has just celebrated handling a million aircraft in one year. We often don't have the airspace available to really put into practice an efficient plan, uh, and we're scrabbling, and with a large number of airplanes in on the frequency all the time, they keep asking for descent, they keep asking for turns, direct routings, and we're responding on RT and we're losing thinking time and, and that is really what uh, is at the, the crux. The controller loses the time to think and plan what he has to do. And at CAA headquarters, the meteoric growth in air traffic seems to have caught planners by surprise. Last summer, it forced them into drastic action. We tackled it by introducing a system of flow management, which means, in effect, that if we think that the number of planes in the sky is going to be more than can be safely handled, we have to tell people to stay on the ground or not to enter British airspace for a little while. That's a system that's been used in, on the continent and in the United States. Flow management means arranging for aircraft to take off in a strictly predetermined order. If a flight misses its slot, it goes to the back of the queue. Inbound aircraft, too, have to arrive at a pre-arranged rate. Flow management results in greater safety at the price of greater delays. 
The reason why we have had to apply these measures this year is that the demand for air traffic services from us here at the, the London Air Traffic Control Centre has in fact exceeded the capacity that we have in some areas of the, uh, um, of the airspace to handle that without applying these measures. What has been the effect of flow management on the controllers themselves? We don't get the very high peaks in the morning and evening that we're used to. We get the same high peaks all day. Um, the growth has been in the quieter periods. And flow control basically gets rid of the supremely high peaks where we could, for example, in the morning, if we had a, a very busy rush, if those aircraft were held for half an hour, it didn't really matter too much to the system. It mattered to the passengers who were being delayed, but it didn't matter to the system because we knew there wasn't, weren't more aeroplanes coming up behind them. We now know that there are aeroplanes behind them. What equipment do controllers have to help them deal with this tidal wave of traffic? What are the tools of their trade? The air traffic controller at West Drayton relies on two basic pieces of equipment. Both are computer driven. The IBM 9020D was bought from the Americans 17 years ago. So was the software which had to be adapted. The computer performs two vital tasks. The first concerns radar. All the information from radar scanners in England and Wales is transmitted back to West Drayton. There it's processed through the 9020. The computer presents the information on the controller's radar screens. They show four basic pieces of information. The aircraft position is marked by a bright dash. Here it's BA-1, Concorde. Next, the aircraft's flight level in hundreds of feet. Here, 1,700 feet. And finally, a code letter showing the route. Here, A means Atlantic. So flight BA-1 is climbing outbound. The computer's second job is to print the so-called flight progress strips. These are strips of card that carry coded flight information, like scheduled departure time and destination. From its memory, the computer produces these strips before each flight. Now to CO003, roger, cleared to flight level 240. The controller then marks the strip with each instruction. Ryman 204, Roger, Squawk 4415, climb to flight level 80. The West Drayton Air Traffic Control Area covers nearly all British airspace, from the Scottish borders to the English Channel and from Wales to the North Sea. This densely packed airspace is divided into nine sectors. Most people think air traffic control is a matter between pilot and airport control tower. This is not so. For most flights, it's centers like West Drayton that control the aircraft. Horizon followed the progress of one short domestic flight, a Bryman Airways Twin Otter. Due to leave Birmingham for Gatwick at 10.20, it's flight 204. The pilot will fly south, mainly through West Drayton's Daventry sector, navigating from one radio beacon to the next. He'll get instructions from many controllers. First, Birmingham Control Tower. Thank you. Runway is wet. Now reported standing water. RBR. 1300 touchdowns, 1400 minutes. Let's report the Gulf X-ray. The curfew is 998. Dense fog and rain are causing delays today. Bryman 204 will be late. At West Drayton, the computer produces the flight progress strip. At Birmingham, a handful of passengers finally get aboard at 11.30. Two, four. Two, four, taxi Holly Point one five, cross runway two four. 
Milwaukee on H1007. Thank you, 1007, and we're cleared to the uh, 15 hole across 24. Bram 2042 to Gatwick via Westcott, flight plan route. Contact radar, we're near 112, zero, decimal 5. Roger, following our departure, routing is via Honley to Wesker, and uh, we're near one contact radar, 120, decimal 5, Bram 204. Okay. Bram 2042 to Gatwick via Cliff, take off, the wind is 2105 knots. Bram 204, thank you. Immediately after takeoff, the pilot is passed from Birmingham visual control to Birmingham approach. Then, after a few miles, he's handed over to West Drayton. Hello, Birmingham. Hello, Birmingham. Uh, Birmingham Airport, 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 Birmingham Airport,
The weather has cleared up. He's made good time. It'll be a direct run into Gatwick. The final handover from Gatwick approach to Gatwick visual. Good afternoon. The Bryman 204 is with you and we're just about to become fully established. Bryman 204, report passing the outer marker, 08 right. Uh, 204, crossing the marker now. Bryman 204, you're clear to land 08 right, surface yeah. wind 170 degrees 6 knots. 204, thank you. He's given an easterly approach because the wind is from the east. Just an hour after taking off from Birmingham, Bryman Flight 204 is touching down at Gatwick. For this apparently simple flight, the air traffic control has been impressively complex. Bryman 204 to the left of ground, 121 decimal 8. Roger, thanks. Uh, along 08 left, and the R for exit for stand 1204. Even during this short journey, he's been under instruction from seven separate groups of air traffic controllers, each handing him over to the next. Most of the million flights that West Drayton handled last year passed off as uneventfully as this one. However, there have been hitches. Most serious of the reports of equipment failure focus on the aging computer. Passengers do get delayed sometimes at Heathrow because the computer output has given us difficulty. The CAA have now replaced the computer's faulty power supply, but they still have problems, particularly with the software. It's a distinction they have difficulty in explaining to the press. I have told you already that we have had problems with two areas and the power supply has led us into one or two times. Why, why does it not lead you to admit that the computer is unreliable? I think he's well, trying to explain that it's not the computer <laughs> itself, that there is a distinction. I mean, from the point of view of an air traffic controller, what matters is the flow of information that he receives. Therefore, it doesn't matter to the air traffic controller whether it's the power supply that has given trouble, or the software, or the mainframe computer itself. I mean, what matters to the air traffic controller is that he gets the information. Controllers have strong views of their own about computer breakdowns. The Guild of Air Traffic Controllers conducted a survey about low morale at West Drayton. What worried them most was the equipment, and almost all said they had witnessed more than three serious computer breakdowns, or flops, within six months. This figure did not include so-called fast startovers, when the computer falters but recovers. This is what happens when there is a full-scale flop. Controllers cannot gain access to the computer's memory. It freezes. The computer ceases to drive the printer. No more flight progress strips. In 40 minutes, the stockpile of strips will be used up. They then have to write every strip by hand. They say when this happens, the operations room is chaotic. The flow control brake is applied. Extensive delays for passengers. There have been uh, six failures in the last 12 months, uh, which have had an impact on the operations external to this unit. I mean by that that they have been significant in the sense that perhaps uh, uh, additional flow measures have been introduced. It's caused delays at airports or for uh, overflying traffic. And when the computer is revived, their problems are not over. Unidentified aircraft can appear on the radar screens. Controllers told Horizon it sounds like 20 questions, with controllers asking pilots, who are you? Where are you going? What height? It's possible to have three aircraft blips on the screen, all showing the same call sign, none of which is correct. 
controllers often face another radar problem too. A computer subsystem processes information for the controller's screen. The identifying call sign, here British Airways 753, and the destination code, here LL for Heathrow, appear in this way. If the computer fails, the call sign is replaced by a four-figure code number and the destination code disappears altogether. They then have to look up voluminous flight logs to re-identify aircraft. More delays. And controllers say this can lead to an erosion of safety margins. Managers disagree. Well, I believe that safety is not affected. Um, clearly, any failure of the technical equipment serving a complex operation like uh, you see here causes us a severe problem. That is why when we plan the system and introduce systems, we allow for this and we provide contingency arrangements either in the form of other equipment or procedures which will handle uh, the uh, ongoing situation in safety. Measuring aviation safety is a controversial matter. The official method is to count the number of air misses. The CAA thinks air miss figures very important. They're now published regularly. The authority says they show a downward trend. Others have doubts. Under the strict definition of an air miss, only a pilot can report one. The pilot's air miss reports come here, to the joint air miss section at RAF Uxbridge, down the road from West Drayton. Group Captain John Maitland chairs the joint air miss working group. Once a month they meet to classify the latest crop of air misses. Definite risk, possible risk or no risk. The information is subjective in itself and therefore it needs professional aviators to assess it and you come in the end to your own feeling about that particular incident and I can't put it stronger than that you can't measure a distance because pilots disagree and in the end you've just got to come to a feeling based on your own flying experience of whether there was or wasn't a risk. Over the last five years Maitland's group has judged 365 air misses to have carried genuine risk of collision. One in every six involved civil airliners. That's one every month. Controllers are not represented on the air miss working group, nor can they report an air miss to the committee. Maitland agrees it's possible that a controller watching his radar may witness an incident which should have been classified as an air miss. It might happen, might well happen, but it's very difficult for anyone who isn't in the aircraft to actually assess whether or not there was a risk of collision. And remember, that's one of the ascent, that is the essential criteria, not just one of many. Um, so ground uh, witnesses, even experienced ones, uh, are, are sometimes uh, misled in their assessment of risk. But pilots admit they can often fly close to other aircraft without knowing it. In cloud or bad weather, they just may not see another plane. If neither pilot was aware, of course there couldn't be an air miss, uh, because one of them's got to report it. On the other hand, it's fairly frequent that one pilot says another came close to it, and the second pilot may, hasn't seen it at all there are incidents and losses of separation that quite clearly do occur where the pilots decide that their safety of their aircraft wasn't impaired um, or they decide for whatever reason that they don't wish to file an air miss uh, and those go unreported um, and since only pilots can file uh, the incidents that are observed by controllers have to be filed by a different method the mandatory occurrence report they don't form part of the statistics that are published by the authority on the question of air misses. So we don't think that they tell the whole picture. There's, there's certainly uh, a distinct lack of uh, statistical information on the safety aspects of air traffic control. The accuracy of air miss figures is often questioned. Controllers like Dave Vaughan are convinced that far more incidents occur 
than appear in Maitland statistics. People have called it the tip of an iceberg. I've no idea how big the submerged bit is. Uh, that I don't know that anyone can check it. What actually happens during an air miss that is reported to Maitland's group? From their confidential report, we reconstructed that air miss last April involving Concorde. Three aircraft were involved. Concorde, flight BA-1 from Heathrow, American Airlines flight 5-1 from Gatwick, and Bryman flight 204 that we saw earlier flying from Birmingham to Gatwick. No one shown in this reconstruction was actually involved. Concorde was prepared for its daily departure for J.F. Kennedy, New York, at about 10.40. At Gatwick, at about the same time, an American Airlines DC-10 was taxiing for takeoff. The Bryman Twin Otter was about 25 miles northwest of Heathrow at 8,000 feet. At about 10.50, Concorde BA-1 was cleared for takeoff and was passed from Heathrow Control to West Drayton. Okay. Speed back, Concorde 1. Good morning, climb 6,000 feet, no ATC speed restriction. 6,000, no speed restriction, Concorde 1. The TMA South Controller told Concorde to climb to a flight level well below the Bryman. His plan was to let the Bryman pass safely overhead before telling Concorde to climb again. A few minutes earlier, American Airlines AA-51 was taking off from Gatwick bound for Dallas, Fort Worth. Now AA-51 would be handed over to the controller at West Drayton. So both AA-51 and Concorde would be talking to him on the same frequency. No ATC speed restriction. Do you want the Concorde down the middle? Hold NDB. The controller instructed the American AA-51 to climb, and this he started to do. This climb instruction was heard by the Concorde crew, who mistakenly thought it was meant for them. They set Concorde to climb, straight towards the southbound Bryman. The controller was under pressure with other traffic. He thought Concorde was maintaining his safe flight level well below the Bryman. This is a reconstruction of what he saw on his radar screen. The blip for Bryman 204 was beginning to merge with another aircraft, and this aircraft seemed to be climbing towards 8,000 feet, the Bryman's own flight level. He asked Concorde to report his height, but it was too late. Through the controller, both pilots reported an official air miss. The joint air miss group prepared their confidential report. It revealed that the twin otter pilot thought that there had been risk of a collision, and that the Concorde pilot admitted that he had passed very close to another aircraft. He should have been at least a thousand feet below him, or three miles distant. He was thus far inside the mandatory separation distance. However, the Air Miss Group decided that there had not been a risk of collision, but agreed that the incident had been caused by the Concorde climbing mistakenly. Their report does point up inadequacies in control equipment. The radar information was garbled, just like Bryman PM204 here. It became almost impossible for the controller to decipher. Also, there was no independent warning system on his screen to alert the busy controller that potential conflict lay ahead. The way in which this air mist report has been classified is good evidence that the system of measuring air safety by using air mist statistics as a barometer is unsound. We don't think that just taking risk-bearing air misses, which we must remember are only reported by pilots, not by controllers, is a true barometer of 
air safety. In America, they have three air misses every day. Two sixty seven nine left lighting one zero five in the middle market clear four take off one one five zero at nine. Twenty one oh three Atlanta Tower number four nine right continue approach one one five zero seven. Six forty one cross from eight right then ground point nine. All right, he'll be your sequence. You get behind him at the west end monitor one one nine point one. Eastern 337, come in, 499, Atlanta Tower 9, right number 2, clear to land. Delta 83 Heavy, cross on 8, right in ground point, 9. 83 Heavy, drive outside the marker for 8, 9. Where was it? Allowance to shoot visual approaches. Alright, right now it is. There's stuff behind me, though, outside of the 20 mile radius. It's solid back there. They say when you die, whether you go to heaven or hell, you have to go through Atlanta first. This was America's busiest airport in Thanksgiving week. Air traffic has grown vastly since deregulation. Then, the president sacked over a thousand controllers. They're still undermanned. Stop. Do not enter. Leaving the station, please move to the center of the vehicle and away from the doors. The scale of America's traffic problem is greater than Britain's, and so are the dangers. Good evening, this is the CBS Sunday Night News. I'm Charles Osgood. The weather was good, the skies were blue and clear, visibility was excellent in Southern California, but two planes, one a Mexican airliner, the other a small private aircraft, hit each other south of Los Angeles today, and it meant death for 67 people on both planes and for some on the ground, where the wreckage set fire to several houses. The private plane had wandered into the Los Angeles terminal area, unseen by air traffic control. This accident brought the safety crisis to a head. The National Safety Board urged that automated warning systems be brought in for both pilots and controllers. Seven eighty nine. Contact the Washington Center. One two zero point nine or five. All right. Try uh, Washington again on 128.15. If no joy, come back. One out south of Seattle. Seven two two whiskey climbing high. Surface of seven thousand. The Americans responded to the air crisis by throwing billions of dollars at the problem. The Leesburg Air Traffic Center controls aircraft from Baltimore to the Carolinas. Here they have equipment different from West Drayton's. 121 Juliet Whiskey, what is your indicated speed, sir? They have vertical radar screens giving easier visibility. Blue Streak 5096 has traffic at 1 o'clock. They talk to one another, not by telephone, but by electronic keyboard. And here they already have the automated warning system recommended after the California crash. It's called Conflict Alert. When two aircraft come within five miles of one another on collision course, the controller gets a warning from his screen. The screen will continue to flash until avoiding action has been taken and the aircraft have separated safely. This system has now been brought in at terminal control areas as well, the American equivalent of West Drayton. Why are they not being used here? Surely it would be useful for incidents like the Concord Air Miss. There is no um, collision avoidance uh, system available in our uh, programming at the moment, which we can employ. Um, the, the reason for this is that uh, we have a highly complex uh, airspace structure in the United Kingdom, which involves a tremendous uh, amount of climbing and descending aircraft and crossing tracks. Aircraft are not in level flight as much as they are in some other areas. Uh, we are currently investigating the parameters which we would have to employ to introduce some conflict alert system in the UK. These have to be very carefully worked out because what we must avoid are constant false alarms in the system. In America, they're a head office in other things too. This is where their old computer used to stand, an IBM 9020 like the model at West Drayton. 
In a few weeks' time, the 1920 will have disappeared from all America's traffic control centers. And this is what's replacing it. The latest installment of the host computer system, so-called because it welcomes existing software. The host computer is ten times faster than its older counterpart and has four times the capacity. The old 9020 had to work flat out to keep pace with increasing traffic. This caused many failures, just as at West Drayton. The new computer need never exceed a small fraction of its capacity. It is designed not to fail for more than 10 seconds in over two years running time. The Americans have a bigger problem than we have. More aircraft, more air misses, more collisions. But they have responded with speed and dollars. Here, the CAA have replaced their radar scanners and have a long-term reorganization plan for West Drayton itself. But this won't start until 1991. West Drayton's computer will not be replaced for several years. The CAA have pledged 200 million pounds investment in new equipment over the next five years. But critics say this may be too little, too late. And past re-equipment plans have been beset by problems. This is Prestwick on the Ayrshire coast, where they've just installed a brand new computer. Here, Oceanic Air Traffic Control regulates all transatlantic flights entering or leaving Britain. These controllers do not use radar to see the aircraft, nor do they talk direct to the pilots. They control the flight paths by computer. Their new computer does have a conflict alert warning system. But the problem is, Oceanic's new computer keeps breaking down. In terms of uh, necessitating a uh, return to what we call manual reversion procedures, that is, procedures where the uh, automated benefits are not possible, uh, the computer in six months has failed a total of 19 times. The computer operation has now been inspected by consultants urgently called in by the CAA. They said more supervisors were needed and the software should be more rigorously tested. We have had consultants in. They have made a, a number of, of proposals and I hope on the basis of their proposals on which we're acting, uh, we will overcome these problems. But I think everybody who has had this latest state-of-the-art technology has often found that in the early stages its performance is sometimes uh, not quite as good as the older equipment which it replaces. It is at Britain's newest airport that the CAA have suffered their latest embarrassment. The authority had licensed the short takeoff and landing de Havilland Dash 7 to operate from London City Airport in the old Docklands. But barely two months after granting the London City Airlines a license to fly, the CAA were forced to suspend all flights to and from Paris on grounds of safety. The Eurocity 0010 is airborne at 10 coming to you. I've got the other one at the holding point ready for departure now. This is how it happened. The CAA had always warned the London City Airlines that accommodating them in the London terminal area would not be possible for some time. So special arrangements had been made. The control tower would pass outbound flights to a temporary control service called Thames Radar. Thames Radar is housed in the control tower at Heathrow. Here, controllers would pick up London City flights and give them radar cover, but only as far as Gatwick. Navy 641 Cosmos. 
After that, London City flights would have to fly low, staying below the saturated London terminal area. At this height, they would be flying through airspace packed with light aircraft, gliders and private jets. Further south, Gatwick control tower was meant to provide radar cover for Dockland flights, but the special radar here is often unmanned. So London city flights were often without any radar control. Their pilots said they had to eyeball it through densely crowded airspace. The story was leaked to the press. Then the situation grew worse with a series of air misses involving London city flights. Bryman's chief pilot complained persistently that the system was most unsatisfactory and dangerous. After that, the CAA had little choice but to suspend Paris flights immediately. Bryman's complaints were hastily investigated by a special CAA inquiry. A month later, the authority offered the airlines a compromise. They would provide radar cover for London city flights along a small section of the route east of Gatwick but for 10 outbound flights only. Inbound flights would still have to eyeball it through uncontrolled airspace. There was no question of accepting any flights regularly into the London terminal area proper. The lessons, the real lessons of the London City Airport are that what we have been saying for the last year, 18 months, about capacity being reached in the London terminal control area, the southeast of England, are in fact true. They're recognised now by the National Air Traffic Services of the Civil Aviation Authority. They are in uh, agreement, or we are in agreement with them, that we cannot provide a systematic access to the TMA airspace for London City traffic without the provision of extra airspace and without the development of uh, specific procedures using that airspace to get the traffic into and out of the TMA. I believe that the CAA should take note of the phenomenal growth that we've experienced in the London area over the last couple of years and indeed a forecast to carry on for the next few years. They should notice that this very small number of extra movements which were projected and were, were operating out of London City Airport could not be accommodated. Now that surely is a pointer that we have indeed reached the capacity of the existing system and it is yet another pointer, another piece of evidence that no, nothing should be spared in efforts to improve and increase that system capacity so that we can face the demands of the future. Otherwise we're going to stifle this growth industry in which we're all involved. After four weeks suspension, Paris flights restarted. The London City affair shows just how close to the margin aircraft have been flying in Britain's most congested airspace. It is clear evidence that our air traffic controllers with present equipment and procedures are struggling to cope with today's deluge of traffic. If the system cannot find room for another 20 flights a day in safety, the system must indeed be overloaded. Thank you. 